you. Um, like you said, my name is Kelsey Jones, and I'm the Marketing Communications Specialist for Caritas Family Solutions. I've been with Caritas for about two years. Uh, so what Caritas means, it's actually a Latin word, and it means love for your neighbor. So it's kind of why we picked that as a nod to our mission statement and what our goal is in the communities that we serve. Um, so we have been around since 1947. You may be surprised by that. Maybe you're familiar with the name. Um, our former name was Christian Social Services uh, or Catholic Social Services prior to that. Uh, we have had a couple name changes. We were associated with the diocese and due to state laws, um, we had to amicably split from the diocese to continue providing services to the most vulnerable throughout Southern Illinois. So we are a social service agency and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about the programs that we offer our community. So our mission is to provide direct services to people of all backgrounds. That is one reason we choose the name Caritas uh, and kind of got away from the religious name because we want the communities to know that we will serve, we do serve all individuals. It doesn't matter what race, what denomination, uh, gender, age. We have a variety of programs um, that kind of sets us apart from most social service agencies. So our vision is to be devoted to the care and treatment of individuals and families, access through a region of uh, net, um, access through a variety of different offices, and promoted uh, committed to promoting a just and caring community. Just a few of the values that we hold sacred: uh, justice, hope, collaboration, community, family life. Um, we think that these are, these values are essential in the communities to have healthy communities that we live in. <coughs> A few facts, we provide services to more than 4,400 individuals each year in 42 counties. Uh, that's the southern region of Illinois. And we serve counties with the highest poverty rate. So uh, 32 of the 40, or 36 of the 42 counties we serve have a poverty rate of 10% or higher. And then 19 of those 32 counties have a poverty rate of 15% or higher. So a lot of the communities that we serve are, they're in great need of these services. And without these resources, uh, they wouldn't have counseling or they wouldn't have uh, the need, the services that they need to continue on to live happy, healthy lives. Uh, we are also Better Business Bureau accredited for, uh, we have the National Charity Seal. This is just uh, a map to show you our service area to get a better grasp of which region uh, of Illinois we serve. So kind of from Makuka and Shelby and Park down all the way to the end of the state. And then the highlighted areas are where our regional offices are. So we have a regional office in East Alton on Berkshire Boulevard, um, if you're familiar with that area. And then we have two offices in Belleville, our headquarters office and another regional office um, where our programs will be moving. And it's also our residential treatment center, which I will tell you a little more about for children. And we're also in Mount Vernon, Carterville, and we have a small satellite office in Effingham. So this shows you that our uh, agency has been growing over the last 10 years. Over the last 10 years, our staff has doubled in size and our revenue has doubled in size. Uh, our CEO, Gary Hilsman, he actually lives in Alton, and he's been with our agency for the last 10 years, helping us grow and add new programs. Our goal is to find the greatest need in the communities we serve and then fulfill that goal. So whether it be for children, youth, families, seniors, we try to meet all the needs that are there. And this is, just shows you our revenue sources. We are largely funded by the state of Illinois, and that is for our foster care program. Uh, we also have some revenue from program service fees, uh, such as counseling, and then um, individual contributions, special events. Uh, a third of our revenue, our revenue this year is actually that was last year's fiscal year. This year it's 18 million. So we fundraise for 3% uh, of that. <coughs> so I'm gonna go back to this from you really quick. Um, many of you may have concerns about the state budget. Um, being a nonprofit, I know that there's been a lot in the news because we didn't have a state budget for the last fiscal year and there's only a stopgap budget for the next six months. You may wonder what that means for our agency. Uh, so like I mentioned, our agency is largely state funded. Uh, through foster care, our largest program. Um, so that's 80% of our revenue, and there is a consent decree in the law for foster care that says the program must be paid for, despite if we have a budget or not. That is also the case with our homes for adults with developmental disabilities, that program must be paid for, because without those services, these people are, these adults with developmental disabilities and these children are in the streets. The children in foster care, the state is their guardian. Their words of the state. So the state has to pay for them to be in these homes or they will be homeless. 
Um, so that's how we've kept going, despite not having a budget for the past year. Other programs uh, that I'll discuss, we have a therapy program for youth who um, have been offenders or have been committed to the Department of Juvenile Justice. Those programs were not receiving funding, and so we had to find different funding streams to keep those programs sustained. Uh, the stopgap budget, it does help for the time being, but it still creates concern for our clients and for our agency um, as to what's going to happen in January when the stopgap budget runs out and then we're stuck in the same place that we were last fiscal year without a budget. So those are our concerns and our concerns are mainly for our clients rather than for our agency because of the additional services, the support services that they receive. So a lot of our foster parents, the bio parents, um, they receive aftercare services for their children, they may um, receive substance abuse help, they may receive um, home help for being homeless, and those programs are being cut. So when those programs are cut, it affects them, it affects the community as a whole, and as a result, we see higher intake of foster care. We see more people in need of services that are actually uh, more costly. So these preventative measures are more cost effective for taxpayers, and they're helpful to people in our communities. So one of our programs that we offer for seniors is Fox River Assisted Living Center. Um, I talked about being a little preventative with the way we're spending tax dollars, and this program focuses on keeping seniors out of, assisted, out of uh, nursing homes and into assisted living where they can live a little more independently. It isn't as expensive for them or for us as taxpayers. Um, it's for low-income seniors, so they have to meet certain requirements for wage and for income. And it's 30 units, and it actually focuses on a social model rather than a medical model. So we don't have a nurse on staff. We do have staff that will help the residents with their medications if they need it. They have housekeeping. They uh, make their meals for them, and they do have that assistance. But it's not necessarily a nursing home where they need um, an RN or a CNA on staff at all times. So that's what makes Fox River a little different. We do have activities for our residents. We get them out in the communities, and they uh, try to do little fundraising events for their own activity funds. Uh, we have raised garden beds for them. That was funded by Wells Fargo. Uh, so they, it kind of feels like a home to them, where they can go out and tend to the garden or take a walk around the sidewalk that encompasses the whole area. There's also a beauty salon, a library, a gaming station, and a lot of different um, activities so that they feel they're in a community. And this is the funds for this come through the Department on Aging. Uh, we our other alternative senior community uh, program is the Senior Community Service Employment Program. This program helps seniors who may have been out of the workforce for a while. Um, maybe they had a death in their family, they experienced a severe illness, and they had to take a leave of absence from their job. That then creates a gap in their resume and in their work history. And as we all know, technology is continuing to evolve. So this program allows them um, to have employment. They are actually, it's from a grant through Senior Service America. And our agency receives the grant, and in turn, we pay the seniors to go into different uh, organizations or communities and work. So they will either work in libraries, hospitals, schools. Um, it kind of depends on what their skill set is and what they're hoping to accomplish. And we create a plan for them with goals to achieve. And then by the end of the program, we hope they will receive unsubsidized employment. Adoption is one of our uh, programs that we've had a long, for the longest amount of time. We started off as a foster care and adoption agency. So we are uh, the largest adoption service provider in Southern <coughs> Illinois, and we've also received accreditation from the Council on Accreditation. Um, so we're pretty proud of how our programs perform. We're always closely monitoring our performance so that we know our clients are getting the best uh, care that they deserve and that we're doing the best that we can for them and being good stewards of the money that we receive from donors. So with our, through our adoption program, we facilitate about eight to 12 adoptions annually. Those are private adoptions and then hundreds more through foster care. Um, and this program is all throughout Southern Illinois. So we help families who may want to expand their family, but they're not able to do so. Uh, maybe they're experiencing infertility or they just uh, would like to adopt a child to grow their family in that way. So we do uh, home studies for adoptions and currently we do uh, international adoptions as well. Pregnancy care kind of, kind of ties into our adoption program. Uh, this is, pregnancy care is kind of what makes our, our agency stand out for our adoption program because this ties in. It's a free service that we offer to expecting mothers who are experiencing unplanned pregnancies. As you know, um, sometimes 
women get pregnant, it's unexpected, and then they don't have a support system around. Maybe their boyfriend or who they were with at the time isn't sticking around to help them make the decision or to help them decide if they should keep the baby and raise the child. So this is where our agency steps in and we help we provide them counseling at no charge. It's confidential. There's a 24-hour hotline that they can call at any time when services are needed. And we just help them make the best choice for them. And whether that's an open adoption or whether they decide to keep their baby, um, we just help talk them through that and realize that they have options if they're not alone. Multi-systemic therapy, this is actually one of my favorite programs. It's one of our newer programs also. This is a program for youth who have been, um, who are at risk of commitment to the Department of Juvenile Justice. So this program is actually really cost effective for taxpayers and it just makes sense. So that's why I like it so much. It serves um, youth 11 to 17. Uh, maybe they, they, most youth have issues uh, with truancy at school or maybe they are just hanging out with the wrong crowd. The parents aren't aware of where they are at any given time of the night. And so they are just doing this to get in trouble and, Kind of getting off on the wrong track. So where we come in, we have a therapist that's assigned to the family, specifically they're in the home uh, anywhere from three to five days a week starting out. And they work in the homes, in the schools, in the communities with all of the different uh, ecological systems that the, the uh, youth has. So their friend, they will meet their friends, they'll meet their teachers, and they get to know all these people. So they have a grip on where the youth is at all times and they help them to get a job if they need a job or to maybe do some extracurricular student activities. Um, so this program was something we had to look for additional funding for once we stopped being funded through the state. So with the grant that we received uh, from the Illinois Children's Healthcare Foundation, it actually allowed us to serve youth that had not been incarcerated yet. So with the Redeploy Illinois, the youth had to be, had to already been incarcerated. So they already had a record and we're kind of working backwards from that. With the grant we received, we can actually get to the child before they've gone to that step, before they've gone to prison and been incarcerated. So this program costs about five thousand, five to seven thousand dollars for each youth for a full year, but incarceration for one youth is a hundred thousand dollars. So it's really cost effective, it makes sense, and there is uh, 30 years of research to back this program that shows it reduces rearrest rates, it reduces substance abuse, it reduces mental health issues for serious offenders. Foster care is our largest program. We are the largest foster care provider in Southern Illinois. We serve about 1,200 children annually, and on any given day, we'll have 800 children minimum in care. Our largest foster care office is actually in this area, in East Alton. Um, and we are also ranked as a top service provider in Illinois for permanency ratings, which means finding uh, children in permanent homes. So the goal of foster care is to find the children a loving home, whether it be returning to their parents after they've received the help that they need, or whether it be um, returning to a, or going to a forever family where they are then adopted. But we want the children to be in a permanent home so that it's stable for them and so they're not being shuffled around or moved through the system. Um, so we're actually really proud of our permanency rates. The state average last year was about 33, or state goal is 33%, state average was 40, and our permanency rating was 50. So we're really proud of how fast we can actually get children into a permanent situation to where they're uh, being allowed to grow healthily. <coughs> Counseling ties into a lot of our programs that you'll see as we go through these. Um, a lot of the foster parents, counseling for foster parents or biological parents or the whole family system, whole family unit together. Um, our counseling services are offered to individuals, couples, groups, families, and we have services from a variety of anger management, marital counseling, depression and grief, uh, just a really long list, uh, children and divorce. So there's counseling services really for everyone, whether it just be at the individual level or at the family level. Our counselors also respond to needs in schools and in churches. Um, so if there is a death in a, a student in a school, our counselors will go out to that school and help those children work through that. Our counseling services are also offered on a sliding scale fee so that they're affordable for people. Uh, and through a grant we've received for the last couple of years, we've been able to provide over 300 hours of free counseling services for people who do not have any resources to pay for counseling but are in great need of the service. And this is also offered through all of our regional offices. Uh, community integrated living arrangements, the, I mentioned these earlier, these are the homes for adults with developmental disabilities. We started this program in uh, fiscal year 2014. 
which was about two years ago, and we're already working on our fourth home. So this program has been expanding pretty rapidly. Um, each home has four adults, and they are located in communities in neighborhoods. So you wouldn't even know if one of these was in your own neighborhood. You wouldn't have to wear it because they just look like regular homes. Uh, two of them are actually in Caseyville, Illinois. We have one in Fairview Heights, and we're currently working on opening a home in Swansea. Um, this allows the individuals to get out from underneath their guardian's roof and to start living more independently. It teaches them life skills to their ability, but there's also staff available 24-7 to provide them the medications that they need. Um, they go to day trainings or jobs or volunteer during the day, so they're not just sitting around the home. They have to be doing something from 9 to 4 during the week uh, to get them out and involved in the community and to continue to develop on their skill sets. Um, so just a little bit of information about um, this is the for adults to live in an institution which Illinois has is the third has ranks third and having the most people in institutions so a lot of other states are moving away from institutions because it's not healthy for the individual and it's not healthy for the community it's actually very expensive so for institutions per month for one individual it's four hundred and twenty nine dollars for an individual to live in a home for a month, it's $88. So it's a lot more cost effective for them to be in these homes and it's better for them and for their health and for their families. So we're hoping to continue to grow this program. Uh, one reason we've been so successful is because we started off with just the four person homes. They also have SILAs that have 16 bed homes or eight bed homes, but they're trying to get away from the larger institutional feeling of um, having so many individuals in a home and make it more, um, kind of dive down, make it more uh, feel at home and more personalized for these clients. And this is just a couple pictures. Um, one of our clients and the staff blowing bubbles on the back deck, and this uh, a couple pictures of our home. The top one is our first home in Caseyville, and the bottom one is our fourth home in Swansea. So as you can see, they just look like regular community homes. St. John Bosco Children's Center uh, is located in Belleville, Illinois, and it is a residential treatment center for children ages six to 13. It is the only residential treatment center for children of this age group south of Bloomington. So currently we purchased the building in October 2014 and we're working on expanding that building, uh, expanding our services and renovating so that we can serve more children. Um, children come to this residential treatment center when they have been uh, serious victims of abuse or neglect. And so they may have been in the foster care system and they were just uh, one placement after placement because of their behaviors and the emotional trauma that they've experienced. And it's not healthy to have them bounce around, so then they will go to a residential. Sometimes they go to a residential immediately, just depending on their circumstances. Um, and here they receive intense therapy, individualized therapy, um, art therapy, counseling, uh, just a variety of different things to help work through those behaviors, and they all have their own treatment plan to, um, we, we don't want kids to live in residential, that's not the goal. The goal is to get them back to a family, but they have to be healthy to go back to a family so that they're not shuffled around. Um, so the fact that this is the only residential treatment center for children of that age range, uh, south of Bloomington, is important because whenever we have children in the southern region, uh, maybe in Carterville, West Frankfurt, in that area, and they're taken up here, it's hard enough for their families as they're receiving the counseling services or the parenting courses that they need to get the child back in their home if that is the goal. It makes it difficult for them to continue that relationship because they may not have the resources to make it up here. And especially if the child has to go to Bloomington or Chicago, it makes it even more difficult to, for them to work on that relationship and for the child to get healthier if they don't have the support system around. Um, typically when these children come to us, they also have, they're also leaving their schools, they're also leaving their friends, um, they're leaving the communities that they know. So we try to make it as home-like for them as possible. So I put some pictures on here to show you. Um, the building was actually a former nursing home, and so it looked really sterile and really institutional, and that's not a healthy place for children who are coming out of these experiences to grow and to become healthier. So that's why we purchased the building and we've been doing intense renovations um, to just give them a, a better place to live. Um, so this is outside the building. What we're also doing with this building, so this is a 64,000 square foot building, we are turning it into a nonprofit collaborative center where other nonprofits or organizations can lease space from us and we can work collaboratively together and share resources. Currently, uh, Foil Teen Ministries has their transitional teen parenting program there. Um, so they have teens who are le learning how to um, run a household, manage money, and things of that nature. So they may also use our counseling services or um, maybe we have a teen who's uh, in our pregnancy care program that can then transition into their 
transitional living program. So if you know the organizations that are looking for, for space, we do have space available and we are looking to fill it. So this is an old view of the hallway before renovations, and this is after. This is a, a child's bedroom before renovations and after. There's the little kitchen. So we've uh, been doing a campaign for renovations, the Focus on Kids campaign, and just trying to raise money um, for the next week because it is a four-phase project. So this is the old living room and the new living room. So you can see the drastic differences of the building beforehand and after. So, we are a nonprofit organization, so if you are looking to get involved, there are several ways to do so. Um, donating is one way. There are always different ways of donating. It doesn't just have to be monetary donations. We also look for in-kind donations. Um, currently, in our East Dalton office, we are looking for outdoor activity type of uh, items, such as like hula hoops or jump ropes or basketballs and things of that nature, because foster kids come to our offices and meet their biological parents for visits and whenever they meet it's nice for them to have an activity to do whether it be inside or outside um, coloring puzzles anything of that nature so that they're interacting with the child and building on that relationship and then they're not just sitting at a table and just talking so it helps develop their relationship uh, these are just the pictures of items we've received in the past um, we're also we're always looking for volunteers uh, we have a volunteer coordinator uh, who joined us last year, so we've been working on developing that program and getting out to uh, getting the community involved more. So if you are looking to volunteer, we have support groups for foster parents. Um, they meet monthly in this region, they meet uh, in the Pontoon Beach area, and it's for about an hour to two hours, and we're looking for babysitters because foster parents, as you know, a lot of times we focus on the biological parents because they need the help, they need parenting courses, the anger management, the drug substance abuse courses, um, they need those things to get healthier, but at the same time, foster parents are also going through their own struggle of having a child come into their home that they love, that the goal is to return them home. And so we try to have a support group where they can all meet and just talk about the things that they're experiencing and have someone who understands that. And so they have the children with them, and so we are always looking for babysitters to come and watch them during that time. Um, also, at one of our solo homes, we are looking for people to paint and do a little bit of work on a shed. So if you know anybody, any handyman skills, we're looking for that also. Um, we also have special events. So I heard you guys had some trivia questions earlier. We have a trivia night in Alton. It's actually at this location, and it's in March. So a little ways out, but just something to keep in mind. Um, we also have a formal gala every year in February. This year it is February 11th in O'Fallon. So, um, with special events, we also have third party events where people host their own events that they like to have fun doing and then donate the money back. So in the bottom, we had a wine tasting fundraiser at the Wine Garden in Belleville. And um, a couple people from the Grey Group of Merrill Lynch organized it and just worked with uh, the owner of the wine garden and held the event. It was really fun, actually, and then just donated the money back. So there's several different ways that you could get involved if you're looking to do so and becoming a foster parent. These are actually two photos of foster parents. Um, this family, they both actually ended up adopting. Um, but we're always looking for foster parents because we, there, are, there is a need for stable, loving homes for these children when they come into care and they've been in these traumatic situations. So that's all I have. I know there's a variety of programs, a lot of information really quick, but if